All right, well, turn with me into your Bibles to uh, turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verses 24 through 34. And for those who are brand new, uh, we integrate our message with social media. So if you're on Facebook, Twitter, our hashtag this evening is Why We Worry. And you can find us on um, uh, Facebook or Twitter at Unplugged CLT, or you can follow me on Twitter at My Coach Josh. Let's give it up for our DJ, DJ T. Let's give it up for him. And you can follow DJ T at DJ T Live on Twitter as well. The Bible says, verse 24 through 34, it says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food? And the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? And which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about your clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. How they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his rights, and all these things will be added unto you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for today is its own trouble. Let's pray. Father God, we just appreciate you, man. I thank you. Uh, I just count on the honor, like I always say, to be able to be in this position to, 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 to share what you shared with me in private, God. I just sometimes I love you more than you ever know. Probably you know more than <laughs> I will even know. But I appreciate you, God, for letting me know what you wanted me to share with your people today because I know that there are people in this room who worry. <clears throat> There's people who are trying to find out why they worry. So, Father God, through your Holy Spirit, I pray that every word that I share today will be impactful, anointed, reaches the soul of everyone in this room, Father, and I appreciate you. In Jesus' name we do pray. Hey, Amen. Let's look at the first verse. We're going to stop. We're going to start with there. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah, Matthew 6, 24 through 34. Matthew 6, 24 through 34. I'll wait till you get there. Oh, you're welcome. No problem, Megan. No problem. Everybody's good? Do y'all need some light? Y'all all right? <laughs> that rhymed. Anyway, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Let's look at that. <clears throat> all of us are slaves to something. Contrary to proper belief, nobody in this room is truly free. All of us are slaves to some level of influence, slaves to some type of person, slaves to some type of ideology. All of us are a slave to something. In our world, we believe that we have this independence. We believe that we are free. If you look at the bulk of your energy, look at the bulk of your efforts, if you look at the bulk of your time, something beyond your essence is leading the charge. There's something that you are a slave to. That's why I love what Jesus was trying to say here. He said, it is impossible for you to serve two masters. Because any person who's divided against themselves, they will lack and dilute their own energy. How can you be effective at one thing or two things at the same time? Both things will end up average. He said you cannot serve God and money. Why did Jesus say that? God and money are two sources of provision. God is the ultimate source of provision. He says, I own a cattle of a thousand hills. What that means is God is extremely rich. Everything is in law. Everything is up under his law. Everything is up under his presence. And so he says, I am the ultimate source of provision. But what happens is we look at money as our provision. See, God is the ultimate source of provision. Money is just a liaison between or a resource by which we get what we need. So what happens is when we declare our independence from God and we say, God, you know what, I'm going to come into this world, I don't want nothing with you. We all struggle with that type of ideology. All of us want to be God. Many people say, I don't want to be God, but you want to be God over your life. Because every time God tries to get connected to your life, we wrestle with God because we don't want nothing beyond our own efforts to control. That's why we worry. Because when we disconnect ourselves from the greatest provider of all time, the one that can speak of the society, not the society, but the galaxy is still holding on, let there be. And if this galaxy is in the worlds and the animals and everything in rotation in this atmosphere is still being hanging and dangling off, let there be, why can't we trust God that he will provide? 
So what happens is we disconnect ourselves like great, like the United States did to Great Britain to declare our independence from God. And so what happens is we say, God, you know what? I want to provide for me. I can't trust that you can provide. I will do what I can take. Let me go to this right school. Let me get the right degree. Let me get the right job. Let me maneuver through this world on my own, only to find out that anything that you do by yourself, without God's hand and without God's grace, you may make a lot of money. You may be successful. But you'll always end up with problems. You will always, every one of us will always find ourselves worrying. Because when it's in your hands, when you the one initiated everything in your life, God is no longer responsible. We're responsible. So he says you cannot serve, <clears throat> excuse me, he said you can't serve both God and money. Let's look at the word provision. The definition of provision is found in the word providing for vision. Provision. When you look at that, you want me to say it again? Are you like that? Tweet it for me. But anyway, <laughs> so I know it's real. So provision. So you're providing for the vision. Vision by definition means something, so th something I can see clearly. When I have clear vision, it means I can see. Chances are many of us have blurred vision. We don't really see what we see because by default we're trying to be God. We're trying to rule our own lives. Therefore, we don't want God's assistance in our lives. So therefore, we execute different things, start new plans, start new endeavors, always to, or doing those things only to find ourselves in a place where we're looking for God anyway. So when you look at provision, when you look at God, like I said, we're slaves to everything. When I understand that I was bought with a price, and you know what that price was? 2,000, a little bit over 2,000 years ago, someone died in my place, dangling on the cross, empty himself of his blood. The price for my freedom, the price of what I am was costly. So when I look back through the corridors of history and look at what Jesus did for me, and I begin to picture myself in the, in the, in the crowd and in, in the amphitheater of, of the crucifixion of the Christ, I find myself seeing that, man, what I thought I was looking at, what I thought my vision was, was blurred. And the lines of my life was blurred. And I began to get, see God who he really is. And I say, you know what? Not only when I connect myself to God and when I place myself under God's rule, if I really lean my life completely trust and wholeheartedly in him, then not only will I see myself clearly, not only will I see my, 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 my life clearly, not only will I see money clearly and anything about my life, I will begin to see what his vision is for me clearly. But when you provide for yourself, you know what you'll do? Many other plans in a man's heart and the purpose of the Lord that prevails. And what happens, we make so many plans. And then when we run out of money, run out of time, run out of energy, we find ourselves in the corridors of life worrying. That's why I thank God that he gripped my soul and bought me with such a significant price so I can be able to see everything clear. Now the lines in my life is no longer blur like Robin Thicke. I can be able to see everything clearly. Let's go to Genesis chapter three so we can really talk about why we worry. Genesis chapter 3, why we worry. God is not sitting there saying that he wants to be the ultimate, and he wants to be the ultimate source of your provision. He does. That doesn't mean that we become lazy and we procrastinate and we begin to just fall in helping God to provide. God said as a farmer, if you look at a farmer, the farmer never calls out to the skies and says, please let it rain. God provides the rain and he provides the seed. All that he's requiring to do is to provide the labor. Stewardship is one of those things that I think we fail to mention in some of our meetings. A steward is a person that manages. A steward is a person who brainstorms and calculates the cost. A steward is a person that actually thoroughly examines anything before he does it or before, or before she does it. What happens is the reason why we find ourselves in a situation we worry is because we're poor stewards. What happens is we'll spend money on all these different things. We extend our energies all these different areas. We'll be in this relationship, that relationship, spending time over here, always to find ourselves in a place where we're begging God, please give me $300. God, I need more money. God, I need more time. It's funny that we complain about the time that we have, but I guarantee Barack Obama and anyone who's any successful have the same 24 hours that you and I have. And they get more done with the time that they have. But it's so sad that we as people, we become so lazy and we fail to get into God's plan to be a steward of our life. God will provide the rain. God will provide the seed. All we have to do is provide the stewardship. Let's see why we worry. Let's see why we worry. Let's look at Genesis 3. Genesis 3. 
Genesis chapter 3. If you don't know where Genesis is, you can get saved after this talk. Just joking. Anyway, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to woman, did God actually say you should not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you should not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, man, I know God. For God knows, that's not in your Bible, but for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You will, you, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for the food, lust of the flesh, and that it was a delight to the eyes, lust of the eye, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, the pride of life, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband. See, Adam went over there cutting grass. And went, Adam was actually right there. And he ate as well. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord Walking in the garden in the cool. See, I love God. God don't walk in the heat. He walked in the cool of the day. And the man and the wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God and among the trees of the garden. It's so sad that when we catch ourselves in trouble, we hide from God's presence and begin to hide behind other things. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid. Because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you was naked, man? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave me. See, we blame God. She gave me the fruit of the tree. And then the Lord God said, then what, girl, what you do? And she said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field on your belly you, will, you shall go and, and the dust you shall eat and all the days of your life I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring he shall bruise your head talking about Jesus and you shall bruise his heel to the woman he said I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing and in pain you shall bring forth children your desire for your husband and he shall rule over you and to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you, and in pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Then the man, then the man called his wife Eve. Because she was the mother of all living, and the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife bear with them going somewhere garments of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now lest, let, uh, now lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man at the east of the garden. And he placed the cherubim in a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way of the tree. Let's break that down <clears throat> on why we worry. Let's look at the garden, the garden. Adam and Eve had everything provided to them. They didn't have to worry about saying, let there be light. They didn't have to worry about making no galaxies. They didn't have to worry about making no, no land and sea. They didn't have to worry about that God provided at all. The two things that God commanded them to do in the garden was peaceful until after they ate from the fruit became painful. What was those two things? God commanded them to tend the garden and to be fruitful and multiply. You notice at the end of chapter 3 it says that once they ate from the tree, the woman's childbearing would be painful, so the fruitful are being multiplied. And, and he began to talk about how Adam would have to, would have to uh, uh, work the ground and all these different things. It's funny how we, when we disconnect ourselves from God and his sovereign will, or we begin to provide for ourselves and we want to become God of our lives, what happens is what God created as the pasture or the rules or the commandments that we'll, we'll, we'll be able to thrive in, once we come, contradict those different things or contradict God's will, we'll always have a conflict. And what happens is what was, the, what was commanded for us to live and thrive in now becomes painful. That's what happens when you leave God. Your marriage begins to fail. Your love life begins to fail. Your purity begins to be dispendable to everyone. Everything about yourself will be decayed because the moment that you say, God, I want to provide for myself, you will begin to act on your own will. And when you act on your own will and you disconnect yourself from God, you'll always find yourself coming back to the God that you left. Why leave God in the first place? The garden. 
all of us have this place where God wants us to thrive. He didn't just die for us to suffer all the days of our lives. He created us for us to live life abundantly. And he's he not talking about always about money. He's not talking always about how he can fabricate your life to make you look good amongst men. He says, how can I give you joy? How can I give you peace? How can I give you love? But we get so consumed by what we want, and we begin to envy the Gentiles, the sinners. We begin to envy what they do. So we try to match our lives according to their lives, only to find ourselves Envious, jealousy, and deprived at the end. And we wonder why we incubate inside of our worry. And we wonder why we do all these great things due to poor stewardship only to find ourselves. Bless you. you. Messed up my point. Just joking, just joking, just joking. That was a good transition. The garden. <laughs> the garden. The garden was the place. And we all have that. The tree. Let's talk about this tree. The tree. Many people, when I talk about this, they ask, why did God even put the tree there? See, the tree wasn't like some toxic, boiling, some type of nasty tree. It wasn't nothing inside the fruit that made them, uh, oh my gosh, I'm naked. It wasn't nothing like that. It was nothing inside the fruit that made them feel that way. The issue was when they bit from that tree, they showed God they didn't really love them. See, all love has restrictions. If there's no restrictions for love, how can I determine if someone truly loves me? If there are no vows, if there's nothing to guard my love, if there's nothing to guard my marriage one day, then how can I even determine if she even loves me? So what happens is God put the tree in the garden for a reason. Because he understands through his sovereign will and man's free will, he needs to test their free will to see how much they love him. Many of us, we have this tree standing in the middle of our garden, in the middle of our lives. And what happened is we get so consumed by how we lose track of what God said about the tree to become in a place where we begin to touch the tree for our own indulgence. And so what happens is we look at God and say, well, he provided everything. And it's funny that the devil always tempts you through this provision of something else beyond what God said. I'm going to go a little bit faster. The garden, the tree, look at the conversation. The conversation. You notice Satan and his angels were the only two people, only groups of people that knew what the fall was. They didn't know what, no, Adam and Eve didn't know what a fall was. All they knew was God and, and grass and, and pastures and animals. That's all they knew. See, Satan was the only one. Satan was there when God created them. The jealousy that boiled inside of him. The envy that boiled inside. Even the angels look at us mysteriously because they can't, they can't sing the songs that we sing because they didn't have to be saved. So you can almost imagine the devil getting eaten up on the inside of himself. And he began to look at us curiously and begin to wonder. And since I'm the one that knows what the fall is, how can I tempt mankind to be in the same eternal fate that I am in? You notice he didn't say, hey, yo, Eve, meet me at the tree. Hey, yo, Eve, come on over here by the tree. I got something to tell you. He didn't put up posters around all the trees. Talking about we got a party over here by the tree. You notice that he just simply met her at the tree. There's a difference between tending and touching. Let's talk about that. Eve was by the tree. God said, you said, you can't eat from it, you can't touch it. Most of our greatest falls and the most of our greatest temptation happens when we're doing well. Most of the issues that happen is when we're actually doing what we're supposed to do. Let's look at tending and touching. Tending, tending. He told him to tend the garden, cut the bushes, cut the grass, man maneuver, whatever you got to do. He told them to tend. When a husband fails to tear his tending his marriage, adultery is inevitable. When a woman stops tending her relationship, everything fails. When you begin to stop tending your period, when you begin to get caught up in, 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 in not tending your life, that's when you get distracted and you fall. So that's why the God says, don't be weary in well-doing for in due season you will reap if you faint not. What happens is we get weary doing well, therefore we compromise. Because we're looking at God like, God, where's your timing? God, where are you going to come through? So we get so consumed by impatience, so consumed by, I need it now. So what happens is we begin to make different decisions, make different actions, only to find ourselves, where are you at, God? We got distracted from tending. We got distracted from tending the garden. Well, anytime you, anytime you lose sight of what God says to do what you feel, you will always find yourself in compromising situations. And let's look at this conversation. Eve, did God say that you can't eat from any tree? Eve was like, it's funny how Satan asks you questions to bring out the truth out of you. Because he understands if I can get you to say what God says, then I can condemn you by what God told you. So when you fail to meet that standard of what God says, now you feel condemned and you don't want to come to God. She said, Eve, did God really say you can't eat from any tree? 
And what did she begin to say? She said, the Lord God said, I can eat from any tree but this tree, and I cannot touch it. Be very careful who you listen to when you're tending. Be very careful who you listen to when you're doing well. Be very careful who you let inside of your life when you're actually doing what God tells you to do. Because you know that she didn't know the food was, she didn't know the tree was good for food. She didn't know it looked good. She was consumed with tending. The moment that you disconnect yourself from God and you disconnect yourself from his provision and his word and his trust in his place in your life, you begin to touch things. When I tend things, I'm tending on the behalf of someone else. When I'm on a job, for example, if I'm on a job where I handle money, I'm tending somebody else's property. I'm tending somebody else's provision. The moment that I become self-hearted, self-centered, and overly indulgent is when I begin to take what I'm tending and apply it to myself. You notice when Eve looked at Satan, and Satan says, God didn't say you can't eat from any tree, and she knew that. And what she said was, I can eat from any tree but of the garden. And the devil always imposed a question to make you compare yourself to God. God says, God is actually jealous of you. Or not God's jealous of you, he's hiding something from you. He says, God knows if you eat of this tree, you'll be like God, knowing good and from evil. You notice Eve never knew what the tree looked like, not the tree, she never knew what the fruit was like. She didn't even care what it looked like. She was just listening to God. And what happened? It was good for food, lust of the flesh. It was delightful to the eye, lust of the eye. And it was enough to make one wise the pride of life. And the moment she ate from that tree and she gave it to her man, Adam, that was the fall. Never let anything distract you from doing what God has told you to do. Because the moment that you get so consumed by what other people are saying, You'll find yourself in compromising positions where you're looking for God, but you're the one that left God. We talked about the garden. Talked about the tree. We talked about the conversation between Satan. Let's read this. He said to the woman, did God actually say you should not eat of the tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the tree, or the fruit of the tree in the garden, but God's we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you should not eat of the fruit of the trees that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, like I said, lest of the flesh, and that, the, that it was a light to the eyes, lest of the eye, and that it was a tree to make one wise, proud of life, she took of his fruit and ate. And she gave also to the husband who also ate with him. You notice Satan never tempts the head. He tempts what the head loves. He never tempts the steward. He maneuvers through what the steward is stewarding. Why did he go to Eve and not Adam? Why did he go to his woman and not to the man? We fellas always find ourselves in compromised situations when our wives or our women or the things that we love is tampered with. We love what we love so deeply, therefore we want to protect it. So what happens, well, he knows that if she gives him the fruit, he's more likely to eat the fruit, more so than if I give him the fruit. You notice when he ate the fruit, when she ate the fruit, their eyes was open. What does that mean, eyes were open? It wasn't like, man, now I can see. It wasn't like they, the eyes popped open, like, man, okay, that's what's up, Eve, I see you. I wasn't going to say what I was going to say. Eve, I see you looking nice. He wasn't trying to say that. The reality and the weight of the condemnation hit them. It wasn't the fruit that made them feel weird. It wasn't that it was high in fructose or high sugar. It wasn't like their blood was low, nothing like that. It was the fact that they said, you know what? I disappointed God. My greatest burdens, my greatest pains, the deepness of my tears come when I know I betrayed God. How do you feel when you're at that moment where you know you betrayed God? And Satan loves to get you in that place where you compromise the things of God because God never, when you sin or when you make a mistake, God never intended for you to run from him. He intended for you to come to him. But what happens is he gets inside of your mind that you got to hide from God, be afraid of God, get away from God because he understands that when you're in his presence and you begin to sacrifice yourself saying, God, I am nothing without you, there's always deliverance. But how can I make you hide behind the trees? How can I make you hide behind your job? How can I make you hide behind your relationship? How can I make you hide behind your false Christianity? How can I get you so eyes open to the point the weight of that condemnation hits you so hard? Because he understands that if I can make them declare out of their mouth what they knew was wrong, then God always has to judge you by what you know. That's why Eve said it out of her mouth. 
the devil trapped her in that conversation because she knows that, okay, if I can get her to say what she knows she shouldn't do, and then I actually make her do what she shouldn't do, then the weight of that condemnation on that couple will be tremendous. And what happens is we get into a place where we worry because we're afraid of God. We worry because we don't want to get into God's presence. Oh, we're afraid because we got some sin in our life. But God said, don't run from me. Why run? I didn't die on the cross for you to run. I died so you can come to me. All you are laid in heavy labor, I will give you what? Rest. But what happened is we get so consumed that I can't approach God. God is some tyrant. God is some egotistical God that don't care about me, but God says, my arms are open. It's more wide than it was on the cross, and if you come to me, I will help you. But what happens is what we do most of the time is what Adam and Eve did. Let's look at the story some more. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked. They were naked the whole time, but the combination revealed it even more. And many people think that God came immediately, but they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves long. So they took some time to sew some leaves together. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. God wasn't trying to be in the heat. He came in the cool. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Fellas, you notice he said to the husband, where are you? Satan always addresses what you are steward of. God always addresses the steward. Adam, where are you? Is that a contradiction people think? See, God wouldn't say, Adam, where are you, for him to know where Adam is. He said, Adam, where are you, for Adam to know where he is. God is an omniscient guy. He's all-knowing. He knew where Adam was. You notice that God walked in the cooler there. That was probably a time where he hung out with them. He, that was probably the time he was like, man, this is where we commune. You actually hiding from the place that I always walk through to talk with you. He said, Adam, where are you? And what did Adam say? Let's read. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Satan always wants you to get you away from the presence of God to hide. And the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. This is a principle I want to make sure I let you know, fellas, or anyone who's a leader. God would never address, you notice he didn't say, Adam and Eve, where are you? Where your girl at? Where Eve at? He didn't say that. He said, Adam, where are you? When you become a man and you want to get in relationships, you want to get married, you better be very careful because there's a lot of weight that's going to be placed on your shoulders. God's not going to address the wife. He's not going to address you. He's going to address the man who's supposed to be the foundation of the household. He's going to address him because he's responsible to tend his family. What happens is the reason why these girls are stripping and twerking like Miley and they're doing all these different things, and I love Miley. Molly's father should have been, and somebody is missing. Because when, you can tell when a garden is not tended when you see weeds. You can tell when a garden is not tended when you see rodents. But it's our responsibility as men and women, it's your responsibility as in whatever you are leadership over of to tend the garden. It takes work, it takes investment. That's why God is going to judge us by what we were supposed to be stewards of. That's why he's going to say, where are you? Are you hiding from them? Don't hide and worry. Don't hide and since I'm worried, I got to make a decision. God said, come to me. Where are you? And where are you today? You notice the three things that Adam did when he asked Adam, where are you? He said, I heard you walking in the cool of the, cool of the day. I heard you walking. So I became afraid. What else? I was naked. And I hid myself. The reason why we worry sometimes is because we don't know who God really is. We think that he has a budget. We think that he's limited. We think that he's not going to forgive us. Many people in this room right now are worrying about things that God wants to help you with. There are things in your life that you're afraid of. Bills are due. Yes, I know. Some of us got diseases, I understand. Many of us are going through complicated situations right now, and God is sitting there saying, I understand it all. But what happens is when we get so consumed by those different things, we become afraid. 
So through fear, false evidence is appearing real. Evidences that are false appearing as if they're real. So what happens is through fear, we isolate ourselves. So then we look at ourselves and we're naked because we're exposed. Nakedness is an example of being exposed, that everything is exposed, or, or it, it explains how we work so hard in doing our own plans to only find out that all our plans failed. So what happens is we're exposed and we don't think God's going to help us with our plans. So what happens is through fear and through lack of preparation, we hide ourselves. Why hide from a God who knows where you are? Why attempt to hide from a God that knows exactly where your location is? God doesn't want you to hide. He wants you to surrender yourself. You notice that the judgment of God didn't happen before he had the conversation with Adam and Eve. The judgment didn't happen. He didn't kick them out of the garden the moment that he saw them for the tree. He asked questions, Adam, where are you? Did you read of the tree of the garden? What God was asking these questions for wasn't for his intelligence, wasn't for him to gather information. He gave them a chance to repent. What if Adam repented? We would probably be in the garden today. But what happens is what happens when we get caught in a situation, we blame someone else. God is the woman that you gave me. God is the environment that you put me in. God is the neighborhood that I grew up in. God is the place that you, you put me with that mom and dad. You put me in that situation. God, you put me here. So I blame God when God says, I know where I plant you. So we get consumed, concerned with God. God, why did you put me in this house? Oh, God said, I put you there for a reason. If I look at my life and I see where I was planted in that single parent home with my mom who worked two jobs, those different trials and those different places that I was in and the different maneuvers that God placed in my life made me who I am today. Do not despise, despise the days of small beginnings. Don't despise the days of where you was planted. Because God ain't saying I just threw her out there. He said, I placed you. I dug the hole. I picked your mom and dad before you was even thought of. I picked your mom and dad before your grandparents even thought of. I had the lineage perfectly aligned for you to come in at the right time so you don't have to worry about anything. We worry because we don't have no trust in God, and we worry because we want to be God of our own lives. We want to control it. And what happens is that anything that you try to control without God's help will always slip out of your hands. Always. All this stuff that I try to control, when I try to control unplug, when I try to control anything that I want to do in my life, it always falls through. God said, just tend it. What are those things you need to tend right now? Don't worry about a relationship. Tend yourself. Don't worry about any. Tend what you are a steward of to tend. Don't try to add anything into your life until you tend what you are tending now. And what happens is our single lives has weeds everywhere. And they want to get a relationship with someone who got weeds. And all of a sudden we just a big mess inside of a fenced garden with nothing of no fruit on the tree. And we wonder why we bear no fruit. We wonder why we suffocate ourselves. All because we make decisions without tending. What needs to be tended first. I don't want more problems in my life. I don't want to add any other stresses to my life because I failed to tend what I needed to tend. And we'll always find ourselves in the middle of a situation where we blame the woman, we blame the serpent, and we blame anything and everything else. I'm done with that, but let me go here. Remember the tree? The tree that was the curse? That if Adam and Eve ate from that tree, they would die? That tree was a foreshadow of the tree that Jesus died on. The Bible says, cursed is every man that hangs on a tree. So what the devil thought he was doing by condemning them was the foreshadow of the redemptive plan of God coming into life to die on a tree that we could eat from. So we don't have to worry about working for God's love. We don't got to worry about tending all these different things outside of God's will. But God said, I die on the cross to buy you with a perfect price. So I bring my spirit inside you to tend you. If I don't have no one tending me, if I don't have God in my life tending me, then when I find myself in complicated situations, I will always worry. But when I know that God and everything he created is still hanging on, let there be, then I can trust that everything he wants in my life is guaranteed. All that he is requiring of me to do is to steward what it is he wants me to steward. What are you God over? What are those things in your life that you're trying to grip hold of? What are those things that you've declared independence from? What are those things you're trying to exclude from God? God, I don't want you to have access to this in my life. What are you trying to provide for? Because whatever it is you're trying to provide for in your own strength, you will be held responsible. The moment that I try to fund this thing and the moment I try to work this thing in my own efforts, it always found myself bankrupt. And I always stopped bankrupt, God, though, not that far, but I always found myself with less. 
because I tried to control something he gave me. You cannot provide for God's vision, even if you had a billion times a billion dollars. You can't provide for it. It's too big. But God's not concerned about your ministerial visions. He's not, care, he's not concerned about the buildings you want to build. He's concerned about how can I get joy in your heart? Can you be even content with me? If God was never to give you anything else, would you still worry because you don't have the things that you're anticipating for? Would you still love God if all he ever did was for you was to die? And it's so sad that we look at the death on the cross as something that was nothing. So what happens is we look at God, okay, that was cute you died for me. I appreciate that, bro. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. But I need a Bentley, though. I need money, though. Anything that you add onto your life that's outside of God's plan, you always find yourself in, enslaved to it. And when you're enslaved to anything that's not belonging to you, that's, belonging to, that's not a part of God's vision, you will always find yourself trapped. How many of us are trying to bring, a, bring more things into our life that we can't even manage? Why would God bring her you in a relationship? Why would he put you in a marriage? Why would he give you a million dollars? Why would he give you anything if he knows you can't even maneuver or manage what he's already giving you? So what happens is we want more things in our life, and we worry because we sit there saying, well, God, how can I manage all these different things? And God said, I didn't put those things in your life because the blessing of the Lord adds no sorrow. Who's added? What sorrow you have in your life? It's probably something that you added to your life. Because when God bless you, and when God comes through for you, like the song back my mom used to say, you don't got to worry about a thing. And I love the fact that he has to always remind me at times. He says, Josh, I got you. I may not know all of your names, but God's got you. But when you begin to provide for yourself, and God's not sitting there saying quit your job and stuff. What he's saying is to be a steward. Don't worry about the rain. Don't worry about the seed. Just do what you're supposed to do. And you won't have to worry about anything else in life because you know that God will supply all of my needs <clears throat> according to what? His riches and glory through Christ. He's not according to yours. It's according to his. So when you know that God's sovereign will is established, that he cannot move according to everything he's ever done for your life, it's already established. He's not maneuvering in your life right now. Everything was already maneuvered. Everything is already destined. Bam. Nothing else. And when you trust in God's timing, you will be patient. You will wait. You will say, God, I may not have it in my life now. Instead of asking God why it's not in your life now, ask him what do I need to do so it can be in my life. And when you ask God real questions like that and saying, God, why am I not married? Jay, you need to work on your lust. Why am I not married? You've got to work on your pride. We've got to let God inside of us through his Holy Spirit attend our hearts because our hearts are wicked, ladies and gentlemen. Desperately wicked. No man knows it. That's why my, my, pat, my heart for you today and part one of this message is to understand this. Never listen to anything outside of God's word. Eve, the only thing that Eve knew was what God said. And the moment that the, the devil came in to contradict what God said was the moment that they fell. Tend what God tells you to tend. Tend and do exactly what he says. Because the moment you fail to tend your relationship, your marriage, you forget, you forget to tend your own life, it's the moment that you begin to touch things for your own indulgence. And when you touch things with your own indulgence and you add more problems to your life, you'll always find yourself looking at those problems crazy. And when you look at those problems crazy, you'll be perplexed, confused. And now you're making more plans to solve your own problems, only to gain more problems. But God says, if you just come to me and you actually listen and seek me, fast and pray. He said, I give you wisdom that, wanna, that you, if you need wisdom, ask of me. So if you're here in this room and you're worried today, ask yourself why. Is it because of my own selfishness? Is it because I'm disobeying God and I'm not listening to him, therefore he's not coming through because I got sin in my life? What is it and why am I worrying if I know that he is taking care of me today? The best way to bake the path of your future, the best way for you to understand how God's going to provide for you in the future is look at how he provided for you in the past. When you look at your past, see, ladies and gentlemen, I don't got to worry about my future. God has a 100% A-plus track record. He always come through. I don't even know how he does it, but he does it. It don't matter if I make so many messes and make bad decisions. He still maneuvered through my poor decisions to bring me out with an A. Every single time. And when I trust that God is God, he is good at being God, ladies and gentlemen. 
He is good at being God. He is good at providing. Trust him. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understandings. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Are you willing to trust him? Because the moment that you declare your independence from God is the moment you fail to trust him. And when you fail to trust the ultimate God that has ultimate confidence, then you put confidence in yourself. And when you put confidence in a depraved heart, you will always find yourself with problems. And when you have many problems, you always find yourself worrying of how you're going to fix your problems. Suffer. Let it go. Get rid of it. And go before God boldly. He said you can go come before the throne of God boldly. No father. Who's a father in the room? No father. No father's going to let their... If your child... One of the greatest things I hear dad say is when they come home from a job, when they come home from work, the greatest joy they feel is when they girl or they baby girl, they baby boy runs and greets them. A good father will never turn away their child. A good father will never turn away a child who loves them. And what we think is we get so consumed that God doesn't want us. God wants you. He don't need you. Need leads to perversion. Any, any person who needs you will learn, turn into perversion. God wants you. So when you make a mistake or when you fall into sin, God expects you to come to him, not to run from him. Let's pray. Father, we just appreciate you. God, I don't even know why I worry. I don't even want to talk about them. I, I don't even know why I worry. Because I understand worrying is a direct assault against the character of a God who can provide anything. God, you can provide anything. You know, I don't, it don't matter if I'm in a desert and I need water. You will provide it. Lord, I just pray that they see you clearly. Help me to see you clearly, God, so I won't have to worry about nothing because, God, it don't matter what money I don't have. It doesn't matter what I don't have in my life. I know that I'm your son and that I know that you got me. If good fathers, if evil fathers on the world can provide food and things for their children here, what more can you provide us? So, God, I pray that you touch their hearts today. And I pray, Father God, they look at their lives and ask themselves why they worry. And we appreciate you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. This is part one of why we worry.